Hi, and welcome to sciencevideos.org. This week we're talking to Prof um, Professor Mills on his recent work on cat attachment theory. Okay, so Professor Mills, could you please give us a short summary of the paper? Hi. Um, yeah, we've been doing some work trying to characterise the relationship between companion animals and their owners. And one of the sort of most widely used models of uh, the relationship is actually based on what's known as attachment. And I think it's worth pointing out right at the start that when we talk about attachment in this context, we're not just talking about a bond. An attachment bond is something more and it has a very specific definition. So uh, an animal that is attached to its owner uses the owner as a base of safety and security. And so it shows a number of um, specific signs. So the characteristics are that they should want to be close to that individual in preference to others that uh, they get distressed when they're isolated and that they usually show signs of pleasure when they're reunited um, and that they use the person as a, a as what we call a safe haven. So if they're scared, they turn to that individual rather than anybody else or do things on their own. And equally, if it's an unusual environment, then they use that individual as a secure base. So they sort of explore going backwards and forwards using that person a, as a base. So there's a number of characteristics. It's not just sort of, uh, it's not just an affectionate bond. And I know that some people have picked up on this and said, you know, hang on, you know, you're saying that uh, cats, cats don't love their owners. That's not what the work is actually about. The work is, is really challenging the idea of whether or not it's an attachment bond. There's been a lot of work in a lot of mammals which have uh, shown that the relationships uh, quite often between young and, and parents or particularly caregivers is an attachment bond. And more recently, people have started to apply that to companion animals and dogs seem to show the, very much this relationship. And there was a little bit of work, a preliminary study done many years ago, a few years ago, um, where they made the same claim about cats. But when you looked at that study, there were a number of potential confounding factors that could have explained the results. And to be honest, we started this work really because we were interested in cats that appeared to be overly attached to their owners. And we had several bits running at the same time. But the first thing was, well, let's actually, first of all, characterize whether or not the cats are attached and then we can do all the other things. So we started to run this study and somewhat to our surprise, we found that the cats, when we controlled for all the variables, cats did not show the signs of attachment that we would have expected to their owners. And uh, one of the major uh, sort of results actually was the inconsistency of cat behavior, which won't come as any surprise, I think, to any cat owner. But, um, you know, we, what it meant was a lot of the measures that we would routinely use actually were not reliable because sometimes the cat would be close to the owner, sometimes the cat wouldn't in the same situation. So there, there are two elements to, I think, the, the findings that we've got. First of all, given the behaviors that were reliable, we could not explain, they were not sufficient for us to infer that actually cats are, have a secure attachment to their owners. They seem to be much more independent. So some people have looked and said, well, the environment, maybe it's not sort of threatening enough. The idea of the strange situation test that we use uh, and lots of other people have used, it was originally developed for use in infants, is that you put the um, individuals into a strange room and then um, with, uh, with a stranger. Now, in a sequence of events, the stranger sometimes leaves and the cat is there with the owner. Sometimes the owner leaves and they're the stranger is with the cat sometimes the cat is on the own on their own and then you look what happens when the stranger returns when the owner returns and we controlled for all the order effects and basically what we found was that uh in this situation yeah the cats did not yeah show what we would consider to be the common signs of attachment so um they didn't in the strange situation use the owner as a uh, as a secure base they actually those that seemed to be scared and we we had a couple of cats that we had we withdrew because we didn't want to distress the cats they just hid themselves they didn't hide you know in the owner or on the owner's lap or anything like that um so there really wasn't any evidence that they were using them in a secure base the only real possible sort of sign that could potentially have been interpreted as secure base was when the owners left they did a lot of meowing um but that 
in itself is not sufficient for us to say the cat is actually attached because there's many other possible reasons why um, cats might meow when their owners left. Um, and our feeling is that perhaps that's more a sign of frustration than actually reflecting uh, the relationship. So, so we, we ran through the um, study and I said the only, that was really the most consistent behavior that uh, the cats showed that indicated that they were distressed when somebody left. They seem just as happy to play with the stranger as the owner, um, you know. And uh, when the stranger came back, if the cat had been on its own, the reactions were very similar to if the owner had come back. So they weren't discriminating the owner from any other person. And, you know, because of that, it's difficult for us to say, you know, the owner has that special, uh, that special role in, as far as safety and security goes. But as I said, one of the other interesting findings that we got was that the cat's behavior was so inherently variable. Now, lots of people do temperament tests on cats for rehoming and things like that. And this really has questions sort of, unless you've checked that your test gives you the same result on two different days, actually it could be a complete waste of time. And since we've done this work, actually we've been doing some other work in shelters and we've generally found that there are very, very few measures that, that are, you know, that you can use to measure the temperament of a cat that show any degree of reliability. So every cat really is different. Um, they're different and they're different from day to day. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the problem. And um, so you were saying about the cats that were meowing, um, is that sort of like a learned behavior that they've learned from other cats or is that something they're sort of mimicking the way we speak so they're almost trying to speak back to us in their frustration? Yeah, that's 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 a, an interesting question because it is something that people talk about at the moment. Now, cats do actually meow sometimes towards other cats, but they do it far more often towards humans. And we think that it is a vocalization that they've they've used they used and translated across for use with humans in particular. It's not that they don't use it with cats, and it gets its results. And we certainly recognize different types of meow. There is a much more piercing meow, which is much more demanding. Uh, and anybody who owns a cat, I'm sure will identify with that. Uh, looking at you, it looks obviously like you've got a cat that does that probably. Um, and, you know, so they, they do adjust uh, their vocalizations according to uh, the, the situation. And, you know, that really piercing, so that they, they, they do have that higher pitch. Um, and certainly in cats, you see much more meowing in people who talk to their cats. Uh, our own cat, actually, you know, I can tell when I've been away for a while because I, usually I'm the one who gets up first in the morning and feeds the cat and I don't talk to her until she's had her food. But my wife's completely the opposite. And when I've been away, the cat is meow, 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 meow to me the whole time until I feed her. So they do certainly, I think, respond to that. Um, were these cats used in the experiment, were they house cats or were they cats that got to go outside um, and do you think that would have had an effect on the results? There's a, there was a mixture in the group um, and as one of the things we tried to select for were actually cats that owners thought were very attached to them um, because as I said when we did this bit of work uh, we were interested actually in a condition that's commonly described in the literature as separation anxiety, which has started to be reported in cats. It's very common in dogs. And what we wanted to do was uh, look at sort of, well, if we do this test, can we work out which elements it relates to? Well, actually the whole second part of the study went by the way because we couldn't find the signs of attachment. Um, so it, as far as we can tell, it actually has no effect um, on, on the cat's behavior. And if you think about it from a biological point of view, cats are largely independent hunters who depend on their own wits to keep themselves safe. It doesn't mean cats cannot um, be together in a social group. And again, there's a common fallacy that people say, oh no, cats are lone hunters and you shouldn't keep cats together. Cats can form social groups, but they're, they're not like human social groups. Um, they can form affectionate relationships with um, other cats and with humans, I, I've no doubt about that. But the um, say the, the way that they actually interact is they're much more independent. They depend on themselves for hunting. Um, they don't, you know, they don't hunt in a pack, so they're not dependent on others. So if you think about it, well, why should they depend on humans for safety and security? They've, they're actually extremely well armed. You know, at the end of each of their feet and in their mouth, they've got very good weapons there. So 
perhaps, yeah, you know, the affectionate bond, why should it be an attachment like it is with an infant and a, a parent? And so part of the big challenges now is to actually work out exactly how you can characterize the, the cat owner relationship. So is the bond that they've got with an owner, is that almost, they're not viewing like a like another cat um, or are they viewing a sort of like equals or or do they realize that we're providing them with the food and that's why they need help? I think, yeah, no, I think that's, you know, from a cat's point of view, it doesn't mean that it's not an affectionate relationship, but they do, what's important to them is the human is the source of resources. And the resources come in many forms. Food and water are obvious ones. Safety is another big one. And it seems from a cat's point of view, actually the relationship is probably based more on that provision of food and uh, water than actually uh, the provision of safety. Um, they will look for you know, safety in the physical world more than the social world. Um, and I think that's quite an important thing. And again, you know, just before people uh, get too upset, actually that means that if, a, if you've got a cat that goes outdoors and he comes home to you, that's, you know, that's a really nice thing that the cat does value you because he is more independent, he could walk away. Um, but often when you hear about, you know, cats that um, end up staying with other people, it's because they're providing food. It's not because they're providing. Occasionally, you know, if somebody, somebody's got a cat and they get a puppy and the cat decides it's going to leave home, but it's not leaving home to find safety and security in other individuals. It's going to another house because they're providing the food without the physical threat. So it's not that sort of nurturing that they're seeking. It doesn't mean they don't like a cuddle. They, they just know they can look after themselves more. Yeah, I think so, yeah. That's, just, that's the way we interpret it. Um, another question, um, how, what's next really for this research um, and how are you looking to test more about this sort of touch? So, I mean, given the results that we got, you know, we've, we've had to sort of sit back. There's, there's two avenues that we want to go down. First, first of all, we want to continue um, to look at this issue of what looked like separation anxiety. If this, this was in a dog, we would think about it in terms of an attachment related problem. In so much as these cats, um, what happens is the, uh, you know, the owner goes out and the cats can vocalize a lot. They can be very destructive. They can urinate or defecate in the home, often on things heavily associated with the owner's scent. Now, up until now, people have tended to think of that as like an attachment related problem. And that's why we call it separation anxiety. From a neurophysiological point of view, that involves particular brain circuits. Now, given the results that we've got, we've started to say, well, yeah, you could interpret it that way, but you could interpret it also perhaps as a sign of frustration. So rather than thinking of it as activation of this attachment system, maybe it, when the person goes, they're frustrated. They still want the person, but it's not actually for the safety and security, it's for other reasons that they want the person. And that hopefully will help us develop more effective and simpler treatments for that situation and also the prevention. So there's that sort of very applied side. The other aspect of what we're um, looking at doing is, um, yeah, then trying to think, okay, if, if it's not a secure attachment and cats are inherently variable, can we find other ways to characterize the affectionate bond? Because personally, you know, I am in no doubt that cats have an affectionate bond with uh, most of their owners. Um, but, you know, attachment doesn't seem to be the right model. So let's try and see what it is. And that's where we're doing some hard thinking at the moment. That's fascinating. Um, thank you so much. Um, could you also tell us a little bit about your other project you're doing? Um, and we can invite our viewers to send in Yes, we're doing another another big sort of cat project that we're doing is actually looking at the recognition of early signs of pain in cats. Again, you know, because people consider cats quite independent and stoical, they tend not to then we tend not to think about them expressing pain very much. And so what we've been doing is uh, we've developed an approach which has so far has been very successful, where we're trying to pick up particularly the facial features and we're working with computer scientists and the idea is within the next 12 months or so that we will have a computer program whereby you can take a picture of your cat and the computer will automatically tell you the probability your cat will be in pain so whether or not you ought to take it to the vet if you're in any doubt uh, if it comes back with a high probability it might not be um, you know it's not going to be 100 percent accurate it, detecting pain is really difficult but at the moment the computer is working at about 80 percent accuracy 
which is about as good as uh, the vets we've tested, to be honest. Um, so we have um, a website where we're asking people to upload pictures of their cats. We want both healthy cats, but also the cat if it's got a painful condition. Um, so that we can use those videos. So people, if you just take a picture, you know, even with just your um, smartphone of the cat from the side, you just rotate it round a couple of times, you can upload it onto the website. We can use it, we can test the computer. You answer a few questions as to whether the cat was healthy. Ideally for training the computer, it's, it's great if we've got the same cat, because then we know the computer can't use sort of superficial cues, you know, supposing all the white cats were in pain or all the black ones were not in pain, it would use that rule. But as I say, the training has gone so far, um, it's been working very well. Um, and so we'd really like cat owners to get involved with that. It sounds like such a great app because as a cat owner, that will help relax you if you think your cat's in pain and it also stops you taking it to the vet if they're actually just having a bit yeah. of a grumpy day. Yeah, well, as I said, it's, it, it's all to help. And yeah, we really want to look to see yeah, what that facial expression is because it's almost certainly there. Okay, so we'll put the link to um, that website below. Um, we'll also put a link to the paper because I think everyone should read this paper because the way it's been reported is not quite the same. Cats yeah. do. Yeah, <laughs> certainly. You have to go. This is a great example, actually, of um, reading beyond the headlines of a newspaper piece. Actually, when you read the content, some of them have been uh, okay, but yeah, it's a good way of uh, upsetting people sometimes. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Um, You're welcome. Thank you. Um, bye. Bye now.